Hi friends, and welcome to this latest webisode in the series sponsored by our friends at LucidChart. Today, I'm going to share with you a framework called the Case for Action, which I have used for many years to help all the stakeholders in a process change initiative see the need for change and embrace it and commit to it. It's an important phase in my methodology and is a part of every one of my project recovery assignments. And this is an, a topic of interest to me because when I am helping organizations that are struggling with their change initiatives, three issues arise again and again. Failure to identify true end-to-end -end processes, a rapid descent into the weeds, and premature formalization of a problem statement. In particular, formalizing a problem statement before we even know what the processes are. So, my mantra is, what first, who and how next, only then, why? Let's take a closer look at what I mean by this. So when I say what first, I mean what is the process or process area we believe is the source of concern? And we'll express that with a process scope model using the track framework. Next, I'm going to ask who is involved in the process, both internally and externally. I'll express that with a process summary chart, initially just showing the involved organizations, internally and externally, eventually showing individual job roles and their responsibilities. Now, then I am going to articulate how is the process currently supported? What systems and mechanisms enable it? And at this point, we now have an end-to-end -end cross functional perspective, and it's safe now to ask why does the process need to change? Because beforehand, we would have been taking a functional or a technical perspective. Now we're looking end to end, which always changes people's impressions of what the problem is. So we're going to answer the question, why does the process need to change with a case for action, which you'll see is a richer and more nuanced form of problem statement. And before we look at that in more detail, I'll remind you, these topics I've touched on, like the scope model and how to identify processes, have been covered in our previous webisodes. So have a look if you haven't already. Now, I first became familiar with this framework in Michael Hammer's landmark book, Reengineering the Corporation. And he described the case for action or case for change as like a pry bar that would pry people loose from their attachment to the status quo and help them see the need to move forward. And he stressed, absolutely correctly, it had to be factual, not exaggerated, and concise, clear, and compelling. Ideally, a one-pager. And he articulated five components to his case for action. Now, I ended up simplifying and resequencing it somewhat to come up with my form because I thought there was maybe too much focus externally on competitive business situations and I thought it was a little premature to be doing diagnostics. But I certainly retained the idea of establishing the context and the costs of an action. So, as I said, I revised it, made it simpler, made it more stakeholder focused. Let's have a look. So my version of the case for change begins with the stakeholders in the process. And that means the customer, of course, the people who do the work in the process, the performers, the enterprise itself, and other organizations as needed. Could be community organizations, regulators, suppliers, partners. And I put special emphasis on understanding the perspective of the performers, because that who is probably going to have to change. Now, once you listed all these problems, the response is sometimes, hey, we're not that bad. And my response is, no, it, it, you're not bad. Uh, and the process wasn't originally bad. What has probably happened is that changes in the environment since the process was first put in place have caused these issues to surface. And we'll look in a, in a minute at a framework for establishing that. At this point, people might say, yay, it's, it's not our fault. And that is a dangerous place to leave them. 
So we'll go one step further and articulate the consequences of inaction. What will happen if we leave the process as is? And we hope this is compelling enough to have everybody say, we'd better get on with it. So let's take a look at the components a little more closely. Stakeholder concerns, my starting point. We're going to look at the perspective, as I said, of various stakeholder groups. But of course, they each have different perspectives, so I probably have different questions. For the customer, is our process too high touch? Is our, our protocols reasonable? Can we locate your work within our process if you have an issue? And are you, in fact, the human glue that holds the process together? For the performers, I'll have a different set of questions. What frustrates you? What would you change if you could? Do you have the tools and support you need? Are you always dealing with a wildly changing workload or problems that are caused upstream? Is there even a process for you to follow? And finally, for the enterprise itself, does the process use resources that would be better deployed elsewhere? Is it a net contributor or a source of problems? And one that has been particularly interesting in some of my assignments, is this process bad enough it got you unflattering attention in the media? Which is a great way to focus executive attention. So, like I said, people might be feeling a little uncomfortable at this point, so we're going to move on and assess context. Again, the idea being that the process was probably just fine for a certain period in its life, but now the environment has changed and the process has become a little out of step. So I have this cheat sheet that I use that I share with groups and I just ask them, which of these areas have changed in your, your business and what has the impact been? And there's always at least four or five or six or seven choices come out of this. The most common four in my practice in recent years are these. Uh, you might be more focused on competition or changes in your business volume. Certainly since the global financial crisis, regulatory change has been a big deal and also workforce changes capturing the knowledge of retiring baby boomers and making processes acceptable to a younger workforce for recruiting and retention purposes. So now we're feeling better about the situation. If you want to know more about this kind of framework, look up PESTL, which stands for Political, Economic, Social, Technical, Legal, Environmental, a framework for doing an environmental scan. Finally, we had the consequences of inaction. And I want to know for the individuals, what is likely to happen if we leave the status quo in place? Could be anything from unsatisfying work environment all the way up to loss of employment. And for the enterprise itself, would we see reduced performance, however we measure that, all the way up to a more extreme case where the organization ceases to function and has to withdraw from the market? So, Here's a real life example for you. A manufacturing client called me in because they were redesigning their core financial reporting processes prior to the selection of off-the-shelf software. A good plan. Unfortunately, they were making no progress and the project has descended into finger pointing and the blame game. Now, because this client had employed me in the past for project recovery, the CFO called me in to see if I could have a look at the situation. So fairly quickly, we did a stakeholder-based assessment, which was really pretty negative. The customer, the financial markets, the fund managers, mutual fund managers were unhappy because they could not get the information they needed for investment decisions. The people who did the work, in particular finance staff, were very unhappy because they spent all their time assembling the numbers in a massive network of linked spreadsheets, no time for value-added analysis. And my direct client, the CFO, was unhappy because he was under constant pressure and criticism, both from the markets and from other executives. So that was a negative enough, negative enough situation. I had to ask, was it always this bad? And the answer was, no, it's just come about in the last few years. So I asked, well, what happened? And they thought about it for a minute. And one fellow said, well, 
It seemed to be around the time of the divestiture, which naturally got my attention. And so I learned an important piece of context. The firm for a hundred years had been part of a huge global conglomerate and their financial reporting was up to head office. But in recent years, they had been divested into a separate publicly traded company. And now the reporting was out to the financial markets, which the processes were never designed to do. And the consequences were their planned acquisition of a competitor was not going ahead because they could not get the information the financial markets needed in order to support the bond issue they wanted to issue to raise the money. And that meant the firm, in fact, was likely to be acquired by the competitor, which is not good news for anybody in the finance department because you want to be in the acquirer, not the acquired. So very quickly, we got people focused and in agreement on what the root causes were and the need for change. And the CFO was very happy because we got all this done in 90 minutes or two hours. He was a big fellow, looked like Grizzly Adams here. And I remember him lumbering towards me saying, Alec, I'm so happy I could just kiss you. And I said, that's not in my contract but I'm very glad I was able to come out and help with this simple and effective framework. So here's a summary of where we've been. Stakeholder assessment to demonstrate there are real issues. Context to show that those issues are surfacing for reasons beyond our control in the wider environment. And finally, consequences of inaction. If we don't fix the process, there are serious consequences individually and for the enterprise. And this all works because it's fact-based, blame-free, and urgent. It's also a great starting point for specifying to be objectives and clarifying the differentiator of your process, what it needs to be great at. But those are topics for a future webisode. So with that, I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you've got some ideas from it. And I suggest you try applying this framework, perhaps retrospectively, on an assignment you've already worked on. So, thanks for being with us today. I appreciate it. And I think you'll be very interested in our next topic. It was very popular in the survey in our initial webinar. We're going to look at best practices for keeping your workflow models relevant and staying out of the weeds. So I look forward to presenting for you again. Thanks again. Bye for now.